We have a wonderful segment for you this evening. I like to warm up to baseball this time of year, whatever the winter is, no matter what the weather has been. It's always too long, and we start to miss the crack of the bat. I have been pleased to have this gentleman on before. His name is Dan Schlossberg. Tonight we'll be discussing his new creation. It's called the New Baseball Bible. It is described as an oversized illustrated paperback that provides readers with an offbeat history of baseball, including more than a thousand illustrations and 10,000 items of information. Can you believe that? This, among other things, or as Vince Scully would say, a whole lot more. I can't wait to talk about this. Dan, how are you this evening? I'm doing great, Tony. Great to be on your show. It's always a pleasure. What got you started in this, and uh, what is the reader's experience like in, in, in reading to me, which seems like a fantastic treatise? Well, thanks for the kind words. I do appreciate it. This book actually began as the baseball catalog way back in 1980. Hmm. And that book was a book of the month club alternate. There were only two sports books that made that distinction that year, the other being number one, which is Billy Martin's book. Yes. And the way I look at it was, it's the old farmer's almanac with a baseball motif. Lots <laughs> of illustrations, lots of unusual art, things never published before anywhere else plus all the usual highlights you'd expect in a baseball encyclopedia. Now, it's something. Out of all the, the games, it would seem to me that baseball is the one that is most given to oddities. Uh, <laughs> and I guess you found that out as you work through this. Oh, very much so. Well, first of all, I'm a hoarder, but I hoard trivia. I love ironies. I love things that one-of-a-kind things. I love numerology. And all of that stuff can be found in this book. I mean, crazy stuff. Like, who knew that Jim Palmer's nickname was Cakes? Cakes. That's just Cakes, because he loved to eat cake on the day he pitched. Ah. <laughs> another, I'll give you another one. Jim, uh, Mickey Lolich, the hero of the 1968 World Series. Everybody thinks of him as a left-handed pitcher, but he was actually right-handed when he was born. He was in a tricycle accident when he was three and had to learn how to use his left hand. Wow, you know, my recollections of Mickey Lowlich was when he was pitching for the New York Mets. And he was living somewhere, I guess, in northern Rockland County. And he would ride to the park on a motorcycle over the Tappan Zee Bridge. That sounds like Mickey Lowlich, for <laughs> sure. Not surprised. <laughs> I guess he didn't want to ride the number seven train with John Rocker. <laughs> <laughs> Different era entirely, I guess. One of the things that caught my eye was um, you have a peach, uh, a peach. Probably she was a peach, but it's a piece about Jackie Mitchell. Jackie is a lady. Tell everybody about Jackie. The girl who struck out Babe Ruth and Lou Gehrig. She was pitching for a independent minor league team called the Chattanooga Lookouts, which was run by Joe Engel, who was an early early on Bill Veck character, a real entrepreneur, mm -hmm. innovative owner. And there was an exhibition game between the Chattanooga Lookouts and the Yankees. And Jackie Mitchell, 17 years old, struck out Babe Ruth and Lou Gehrig. The very next day, Commissioner Kennesaw Mountain Landis voided her contract and said, baseball is too hard for girls to play. <laughs> oh, my dear. What was the Babe's reaction? I mean, he must have been... I mean, the, the Babe probably had a red face anyway. It must have been a whole lot redder. I'm sure it was. I mean, I'm sure he was embarrassed. But when Luke Gehrig also struck out, I mean, this girl must have had something on the ball. It's absolutely amazing. And, you know, the... Um, I was going to ask you about this. I don't know if you've covered it in the book. Um, was the oldest battery ever to play in a game uh, Warren Spahn and Yogi Berra with the Mets? Well, as Warren Spahn said, we may not be the oldest, but we'll certainly be the ugliest. <laughs> <laughs> wow. And uh, I, uh, the, the Mets were trying everything in those days. You know, Yogi only played eight games for the Mets. He came out of retirement. He'd been off for the entire previous year. Yeah. But he managed the Yankees in 64. Then he came back with the Mets as a player coach 
and he found that he couldn't play anymore. And when he struck out three times in his last game, he said, that's it, I can't hit. Well, you know, and, 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 and you think about that, and you say, how could such a thing happen? That's, like, unthinkable, but these were workaday jobs back then. These... That's right. Players had one-year contracts. They had off-season jobs. They didn't even make that much money. I mean, there was no real union at the time. And these guys, you know, $100,000 was a huge contract. In fact, even as late as Hank Aaron's heyday, Hank Aaron, the all-time home run king in my book, never made more than 250000 in a season. And now the minimum salary is double the peak salary Hank Aaron ever made. It's, it's absolutely incredible when you think of it. Here's an oddity for you, uh, which kind of dawned on me the other day in one of my few lucid moments. I don't know if you cover the book, um, Baseball Players Who Acted in Television Shows. Well, Chuck Connor comes to The Rifleman. Oh, sure. And he, he is the guy who really springs to mind. But, but there are many others. Leo DeRocha was in quite a few TV shows. He sure was. But, yeah, he almost signed Mr. Ed. He almost signed Herman Monster. That's right. <laughs> we don't do anything to win. Guys. I mean, these guys needed the extra bucks in those days, and yeah. it was a lot of fun. Well, you know, I was pulling out a, um, a clip of an old combat show where Warren Spahn had played a German lieutenant in the beginning. That's true, and that's interesting because Warren Spahn in real life was the only major leaguer who got a battlefield commission during World War II. Right, and uh, was involved in the bridge at Remagen. And I said to our mutual friend, Bob Lazari, well, you know, he's out in Los Angeles. He probably acted that day, went to Dodger Stadium that night, and beat Drysdale 2-1. to one. <laughs> you know, it's like... Probably had a home run to win the game, too. <laughs> Ah, uh, what, what an era. You know, one of the things in your book that really caught me was, in a great uh, trivia question, the only Hall of Famer ever to pay his way in. And uh, that was Mike Piazza. That's correct. Mike Piazza, he really wanted to see the Hall of Fame. And once he got to the Hall of Fame, obviously he didn't have to pay his way in anymore. But I got to tell you, what I, what I said to Mike Piazza last year at the Hall of Fame, the last event that they have is called the Monday Roundtable. Mm -hmm. And it's at Doubleday Field. The fans sit in the bleachers. The media sits on folding chairs in front. And they only had two Hall of Famers. They had Piazza and Griffey. And as Piazza left the stage, I walked up to him and I said, Mike, this is the bar mitzvah you never had. <laughs> wow, that, that, that's absolutely amazing. This is about you, it's not about me, but when I think about baseball trivia, my, my, my brain kind of spins off. What are the most fascinating um, items of trivia, or as Joe Franklin would say, ephemera or oddities uh, that you found as you were updating this book? Oh, there are so many, Tony. One of my favorite things, I love numerology, so I've got to give you numerology. Mm -hmm. Hank Aaron, my favorite player of all time, war number 44, hit his record-breaking home run off a pitcher wearing number 44, Al Downing. He did it on April 8th, 1974, a month, a year, and a day divisible by the number four. He did it in the fourth game on the fourth pitch in the fourth inning. That, that's amazing. That's almost like the parallels between the, um, the Lincoln assassination and the Kennedy assassination. That's right. And, and you know what? There's a lot about presidents in this book, too, because presidents were very much involved in baseball. And in fact, that leads me into the Ronald Reagan story. Ronald Reagan probably never would have become president if not for baseball. He began as a radio announcer for WHO Radio in Des Moines, Iowa, and he went to Catalina Island to cover Cup Spring training. And he was heard on the air by an actress named Joy Hodges, who said, I would love to get you a screen test. You have a wonderful voice. So Reagan got a screen test. He got into movies, became active in politics with the Screen Actors Guild, became president of the Screen Actors Guild, governor of California, and used it as a stepping stone to the White House. It's amazing. And also the host of, uh, of Death Valley Days at one point. <laughs> right, and General Electric Theater. I remember Gen that vividly. Yeah, yeah. I for certain. He, uh, interestingly enough, when he was working for General Electric, he would make frequent trips over to the plant in Bridgeport, and a lot. And he would, they'd send him around to do public relations and things, which I guess started him in politics, being in front of people, you know, taking positions on things, and they they loved him. 
And George W. Bush, we can't forget either, he said that he wanted to be commissioner of baseball. But the other owners didn't want him, so turned his attention to being the governor of Georgia and became president. But he was the owner of the Texas Rangers. That's absolutely correct. Now, is there any truth um, to the story that um, the Kennedy family, Joseph Kennedy, the patriarch, um, when he was setting up his design for what his boys would do, um, Joe, who was killed in the war, uh, Joe Jr., was to be president where he wanted John, uh, you know, our 35th president, to be a baseball owner. Is there any truth in that that uh, you might have run across? There really is. They were heavily involved in Boston politics, as you know, and Honey Fitz, uh, actually yeah, was Mayor involved Boston. in the opening of Fenway Park in 1912 because he was the mayor of Boston. And he threw out the first pitch in the first game at Fenway Park. By the way, which didn't get very much publicity because the Titanic sunk on the same day. Unbelievable. Now, was there something in the 1912 World Series where um, Joe Wood was getting ready to hear play ball and timeout was called because Honey Fetz wanted to get a hundred of his pals in the bleachers and the bleachers were jammed so they threw a hundred people out and they put Honey Fitz's people in and um, Joe Wood's arm froze up? I don't know about Joe Wood's arm freezing up but I bet Honey Fitz's fans did if it was that early in the season. <laughs> it's, it's absolutely unbelievable when you actually start to think about it. Interesting thing you say here in the book about Lou Burdett pitched as many shutouts against the Yankees in 1957 as the entire American League managed against that team. That is an amazing thing. Right, in the 57 World Series. Yes. So, yeah, that's kind of incredible. In the 57 World Series, he beat the Yankees three times. Two of those wins were shutouts, and the Yankees had been shut out only twice all season by the entire league. That's, uh, th that is an amazing, amazing feat. Um... Rogers Hornsby, you also mentioned, and you know, I remember him because as a small child, I was an early Met fan. I was one of the, probably one of the youngest people to get into the polo grounds in 1962. And he really was a tough critic on ball players. you were mentioning, when he was doing his scouting. Oh, for sure. In 1961, the year before the Mets actually began play, the Mets sent him to scout all the other 18 teams at the time. Remember, the American League had already expanded, so there were 12, 10 teams in the American League and 8 in the National League. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, Rogers Hornsby was looking around at the players and filing reports, and pretty negative reports on everybody, except one guy that he said, eh, this guy looks like a ball player. That was Mickey Mantle. <laughs> oh, my dear. He was actually, I guess, if you could say it, before the um, position was formalized, probably one of the first hitting coaches. That is true. He was with Casey Stengel. Casey and Roger were old old teammates, old you know, friends from way back when, early in the century. Mm -hmm. And the original Mets had Rogers Hornsby as their hitting coach. It's, uh, it, yeah. it didn't help, by the way. Yeah, I mean, I can only imagine his tolerance level was probably something uh, less than minimal of, uh, of those with abilities that he didn't have. Yeah, the only one with any ability was Rich Ashburn, who hit something like 306. He was the only decent hitter on that whole team. Everybody else was over the hill, either has been or never would be. Yeah, it's... <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and then Casey, I guess, you know, how, how often was he awake during the games? I guess we'll never really know. <laughs> now, another guy who did pretty well was Frank Thomas, the original Frank Thomas. The original, yeah. Hockey years. He had 34 home runs that year. Yeah, and he, um, I've spoken to him in the past, and uh, he is, uh, he's quite a man. He really has like a workaday ethic. And uh, when you think of blue collar ball player, you know, you think of Mr. Thomas. You definitely do. And, of course, the second Frank Thomas came along later and made the Hall of Fame eventually. But they were very, very different ballplayers, totally different. Yeah, for certain. And it's, uh, yeah, it was really quite an era. And the, uh, well, if, if you go back to it, um, when they were losing, Howard Cosell would always say how much it troubled him because uh, it was um, a package, in, in his estimation, if I recall, to make futility palatable. 
Mm. Yes, and I love the title of Jimmy Breslin's book, by the way. Can anybody here play this game? Yes. Which was really a Casey Stengel quote, but it's a great book title. It's it, it, it's really an amazing thing. The uh, one of the things you do mention here: three hundred thousand to one. Um, the odds of being hit by a foul ball by uh, someone you know, and this actually happened in 2006. It did. Uh, a player named uh, John Gibbons fouled off a ball and hit his, I can't, I can't remember whether it was his mother or something like that, or his wife, but he, he hit somebody who was there on a free ticket that he had given out. But I'll, I'll tell you a better one. A uh, number of years earlier, Rich Ashburn used to foul off lots of balls when he played for the Phillies. Mm -hmm. He was a leadoff man, and he would foul off balls he didn't like, pitches he didn't like. He hit the mother of the sports editor of the Philadelphia Bulletin, uh -huh. and as she was being carted off on a stretcher, he hit her again <laughs> in the same at bat. <laughs> that, I mean, that's unspeakable. Didn't the same thing happen with Bob Feller? Bob Feller, yeah, Bob Feller, I think, hit his mother-in-law with a, had, it was, had to be a foul ball at the time, couldn't have been a wild pitch, although Feller didn't have the greatest control in the world, but it had to be a foul ball. Yeah, I think it was on Mother's Day, if I recall. Yes, that is that is correct. That happened on Mother's Day. But the odds are still 300,000 to 1, according to Ripley's Believe It or Not. It's <laughs> oh, oh, only in the game of baseball. Um, is there a part in the book uh, about um, baseball players who served in elected office? Yes. Uh, Vinegar Ben Mizell comes to mind because he was a congressman. Mm -hmm. I, I love that name, too. Wilmer Vinegar Ben Mizell because he came from Vinegar Bend, Indiana. <laughs> I was, uh, you know, again, I was kidding with Bob Lazari, and I was saying, uh, my wife, God bless her, really can cook, but I uh, have trouble remembering dinner two nights ago and three nights ago, but I still remember Lindsey Nelson saying, announcing a certain pitcher by saying, Calvin Coolidge, Julius Caesar, William Francis Tuscahoma McWish. Cal McWish, a great <laughs> pitcher in the American League with the Indians, went 19 and 8 one year, almost won the Cy Young Award, but then, you know, he pitched for some other teams, and and he was, I guess he was burdened by that long name. <laughs> yeah, Lindsey Nelson would say that, and he'd announce the games from Pittsburgh on the banks of the Allegheny and the Mahongahela. I mean, both Lindsey and Ralph would consistently send me to my dictionary. Ralph would talk about the vicissitudes of baseball, and baseball is an ephemeral game. I mean, you mentioned that to baseball fans. No, no, no idea what you're talking about. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I loved Ralph Kiner. Ralph was great. I remember one time he had Choo Choo Coleman on his post-game show, Kiner's Corner. And he had, you know, the original Mets didn't have very many star players, and they lost almost every single day. Sure. And so Ralph had to settle for Choo Choo Coleman, who was a catcher who couldn't hit, couldn't throw, and couldn't run. And very quickly, Ralph ran out of questions. So he said to Choo Choo, what's your wife's name and what's she like? And Choo Choo thought for a second and said, her name is Mrs. Coleman, and she likes me. <laughs> <laughs> ah, yeah, it's uh wonder how many times Choo Choo put down two fingers when he was calling pitches. <laughs> yeah, and Casey, Casey, you know, somebody asked Casey after the game what Choo Choo was putting down, and Casey said, I, I really don't know, I'll have to ask him. And so, you know, next time, next time there was a game, Choo Choo was looking down at his own fingers to see how many fingers he was putting down. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't know that. That's unbelievable. Now, for the whippersnappers in the audience, and we've got a few, tell them where the um, the clubhouse in the polo grounds was. Dead center field, and it was a hike. It was really way out there, dead center. I mean, for years, nobody had a home run into that area of the center field bleachers. And then it, it kind of happened on consecutive nights. Hank Aaron and Lou Brock did it on consecutive nights. Yeah. Of course, it was against the Mets pitching, so that's understandable. <laughs> yeah, it's. I have fond memories of that park, and I went when I was six years old, and I went when I was seven years old. It's unbelievable. It still makes an impression on me to this well, day. I got to tell you, I saw Maury Wills at two home runs in a game. The only time in his career he did it, one barely cleared the left field wall, and the other was an inside the parker, but they were both in the same game. <laughs> Wow, makes me think of when I went to Yankee Stadium 
1968 on Old Timers Day, Mickey Mantle, for some reason, used to eat Jim Merritt alive and hit two home runs off from that day. And uh, one of them uh, just cleared the 302 and right by a foot. The other one just made it over Cesar Tovar's glove in left field. Well, I guess that was the oh. 302 and left and the 298 and right. And if Cesar Tovar was maybe five foot six instead of five foot three, he would have caught the ball. <laughs> yeah, that's probably true. But I got to tell you, I also saw Hobie Landreth beat Warren Spawn with a ninth inning home run at the Polo Grant. It was a fly ball that barely went over the fence in right field. Wow. Out of the ninth inning with two outs, somebody got on base on an error. That was the difference in the game. Spawn kicked his glove all the way to the dugout, and it was the only home run landed hit for the Mets before being traded for Marv Thronberry. <laughs> Marv was Marv. Uh, only in this great game of ours. In our closing moments together, I would like for you, Dan, to solve a dilemma. Um, we had a manager years ago uh, by the name of Connie Mack that wore yes. a suit on the field. For many years, not a baseball suit, but a, uh, a dress suit. Why is that, and what happened to stop managers from wearing dress clothes? Well, Connie Mack did it because, number one, he owned the team. He could do whatever he wanted. <laughs> he managed for just about 50 years at Philadelphia Athletics. But the reason he wore the suit instead of a uniform was he had a very hot temper. And he admitted that by wearing the suit, he could sit on the bench after the game while the players were in the showers, and he could cool off before coming in and screaming at the players and throwing things, and that gave him a, a cooling off period, and that's why he wore the suit. <laughs> Only in Philadelphia, I guess. But anyway. Yeah, well, only if you own the team, too. Yeah, for, for certain. <laughs> <laughs> the book is the New Baseball Bible List Legends, Notes, and Nuggets from the National Pastime. The author is Dan Schlossberg. Dan, where can our friends and fans follow you and or buy this book? Well, they can get it at Amazon.com or Barnes & Noble, any major bookstore, and they can come to any of my signings. I'm going to be signing at the Baseball Hall of Fame on Thursday, July 27th at 1 o'clock. How about that? And I have a whole bunch of other signings set up in the New York metro area, northern New Jersey, where I live. And the next one is going to be April 1st at Barnes & Noble at Riverside Square, Hackensack, New Jersey, this coming Saturday at 2 o'clock. Wow. Well, let me know when you cross uh, the river to this side of the Hudson. I mean, it's a little bit of a ride, but uh, would love to come down and see you. Well, I can tell you right now, June 14th, I'll be at Foley's which is an Irish bar at the baseball attic. Manhattan. June 14th, that's Flag Day. I'll be there from 5 to 7 p.m. signing the book. Fantastic. And uh, uh, God, God, God blessing and the world not going into insurrection. Uh, let me uh, try to make a date of that. <laughs> and uh, I totally understand that comment and agree with you totally. <laughs> Dan, thanks so much. And I'm sure we'll be chatting again. And, of course, best to you and uh, best wishes with the book. Tony, thank you very much. Much appreciated. By the way, we got to tell you, let's just one thing. Sure. This is the bargain of the year. It's $17.99 for 424 pages. You're not going to beat that anywhere. Wow. I mean, that would keep me occupied for a summer. You know, it reminds me of Phil Rizzuto that talked about the kid he was in Catholic school with who read the dictionary from A to Z. I mean, this is a whole lot more fun. Thank you so much. You put it in your bathroom and read it backwards, you'll still enjoy it. <laughs> Thanks so much, Dan. Really appreciate it. Thank you, Tony. Great being on your show. Thank you. It's great to have you. Thank you. And that was Dan Schlossberg. And we're going to be coming back with some wild retro commercials, and then we're going to see where we go. So, Leon Russell lost him recently, Lady Blue. Tony D'Angelo here on PM Coast to Coast. We'll be right back right after this. 